two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. You'll be delighted and relieved to know if you watch this on YouTube for the last couple of weeks that I have taken off my uh, beautiful Cambridge United shirt just to wear a rubbish old t-shirt. I feel slightly disloyal, but that, uh, that Cambridge United shirt is now being proudly worn in Atlanta and Chattanooga, I think. Is it Chattanooga where um, Ernie lives? Oh, I made that up. I think so, yeah. Yep, as far as I can remember. Um, good. Spreading the, uh, the wise words. At some point, I shall wear an Atlanta MLS shirt here. But enough of sport, because I can hear most people yawning at this stage. They want to know about books. And we're talking not just a genre here in this particular episode, but sub-genres and some of the marketing considerations that are, you need to take into account when you're working in... I was going to say niche areas. It is a niche area, but some niches are bigger than others, and this is quite a big one. So clean and wholesome, or wasn't that a song by the Smiths? Yeah, <laughs> very probably. Um, yeah, I mean, clean- James didn't get that joke. No, I don't. I'm not Smiths guy. Pink, do a Pink Floyd joke. I'll get it. Um, some girls are bigger than others. Uh, okay, there you go. So we are talking uh, clean and wholesome, sweet romance, the sort of books that you'll probably read when you're on the train to London. He meets her. They Me. k- they kiss. From the interview with Amy Meyer, she says, I think they, the, the kiss is an important thing and it comes towards the end of the book and it's kind of the denouement uh, of the book. So it's that, it's about the relationship and it is what it says it is. And this is what you're going to get out of this interview is how this genre works and how this can apply to other genres. So uh, it's very interesting. Amy's um, uh, done absolutely fantastic over uh, recent years, and in fact, not that long at all. And considering, as she reveals in this interview, she has five children, I think under 12, which is a house full of children, right? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Can you, can you only, terrifying. only imagine? She has a really good situation at work. She's obviously done very well and applies herself uh, efficiently to her work. So let's hear from Amy. Let's hear from the sweet romance princess and then talk uh, more about it when we get back. Amy Meyer, we've just been discussing off air that you're Anne-Marie Meyer in, uh, Correct. in your pen name, which is... Mm-hmm. Your nom de plume. Uh, so, if people want to look up your books, uh, welcome to the podcast. It's really exciting to have you on here. I think you're somewhere in Minnesota. Did I read Minnesota? Yes, I'm about 20 minutes south of the Twin Cities. So. Oh, you are. Okay, we were there earlier this year. A great place to be. We went to Prince's House, which is, of course, in oh, uh, really? In Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. I've never have... been there, but I know we're big Prince people because that's where we came from. So. Yeah, it's really worth a visit. It's absolutely uh, a fascinating uh, visit if you want to uh, look into the mind of an unusual individual. <laughs> and uh, which writer doesn't want to look into the mind of an unusual individual? So this is very true. <laughs> okay, look, Amy, we're going to talk about sweet romance. What a lovely subject to talk about about nice, fluffy kitten, sweet romance. And you're going yes. to educate me about uh, the uh, the genre, the tropes, the things to get right, uh, things that can go wrong when you're in this area. And we know commercially it's a big area. It's competitive, but it's a big area. And your readers are generally voracious readers. So that's a good thing, right, right for selling books. Yes. But before we do any of that, I want to know a bit more about Amy. So you need to tell me your background and how you got to where you are today. Okay, well, I um, a long time ago when I was a teenager, I had written on a goal sheet that I wanted to publish or write and publish a novel. So I am a mom of five kids, and they range from 11 till 1. So I'm a very busy, busy mom. Wow. Um, I That's, do it. That is busy. <laughs> and they're four boys. I have four boys, and then my one-year-old is a girl. So anyone who is mom of boys knows what I'm talking about. Can I, can I be um, rude and just say, did you keep going until you got a girl? Was that... Did you basically say, say to your husband? I would say if my third or fourth had been a girl, I probably would have stopped. But I'm happy with my girl. How? My husband, like, wants more. But wow. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's like, raise the ones we have right now because... 
then there's some days where he's like, we're done. Why do we have this many? Five's not enough for your husband. Okay, right. Well, yeah, five, uh, five under 12 <laughs> yeah. is, is busy. Okay, so you're busy. Yes. But yeah, well, what? but I do it because my husband, and I can write as much as I do because my husband does work from home. Okay. So we own a business um, that he runs out of our basement. So that is huge help. He goes to work for four hours, then comes upstairs, and then we swap. I go right for four hours. And so that's been really helpful. I, I would not be able to be as prolific as I am having a husband that works all the time. So Sure, sure. And we're going to talk about uh, quantity of writing. I know that's something that, that's important to you. So you had this childhood yes. ambition, a bit like the young Mark Dawson, who also wanted to write stories when he was a, a schoolboy in shorts. Um, you developed it at some point then you started writing so um right before i got pregnant or had my third child i said okay i'm gonna start this goal i'm gonna start this book and of course i decided to write the most complicated book you could think of where i was gonna throw all of the genres that i loved into this one book and it was a time traveling and it was set in the future dystopian crazy book but i kind of figured i worked on it for about four years and that was kind of my schooling into how to write um so i had a friend who read it and she was like i don't really understand why they did this and then i was like okay well stop reading i'm gonna go back and rewrite it so i rewrote that one and after i finished i was like wow my main character is really flat so i rewrote it again so i wrote about 150,000 words before i decided to do like a ya um cinderella retelling but told in the modern times and she has superpowers so i wrote that book and i joined a lot of like facebook groups beta reading groups i joined um I was just, I'm the type of person that I want as much information as possible and I will go out and I will find it. And I have no problem asking people questions. And so I will contact them. And I got onto a website, uh, to a Facebook group, and I had put on there, hey guys, this person, this kid read my book and she said this about it. And I was reached out to by Victorine Liesky. She's a New York Times bestseller. She's also another sweet romance author. And she was like, I am a self-published author. And she, what I love about our group, because we also have a podcast that we call The Writing Gals, we share information and we share numbers. And I think numbers in the indie world is so important mm -hmm. because we're like, is anybody making money at this? Is it just me or is, am I the only one that's not? And if you are, how are you making money? Because that's all, you know, we want to say, oh, we just do it for the craft. But we want to make money. Like, of come on, I want to make money. Yeah, we can be honest <laughs> so, about it. You got five kids to feed. <laughs> I know, right? And to like put through college and pay for yeah. prices. Um, and so she was like, "Hey, if you ever want to go indie," because I was like, "No, I wanted an agent. I want an agent." She's like, "Well, if you want to go indie, let me know, and I will like I'll send your book to my newsletter, and I will help you through this." And I was like, "Okay." So I set a date for myself. If I don't get an agent interested, and I had some, some requested full, some requested partials. Um, and if I didn't get to that date and I still hadn't gotten anybody, then I was going to self-publish. And so I ended up self-publishing that book. Um, but I ever like it sort of did okay. And then it just kind of failed. It went down and it just didn't hit the market that it needed to. And then at that time, a group of my friends were like, we're going to write a sweet adult billionaire romance story and i was like can i join your group can i do that too and but victorine is a huge person in studying the market and i had been watching a lot of chris fox videos and mark dawson videos and trying to figure out how do you find an, a group of people who will pay for your books and how do you write a book so they know what they're getting like i love my fairy tale retelling but it's a very complicated book. Mm -hmm. And you can't just look at the cover and title and know, okay, if I read this book, this is what I'm gonna get. So I've done tons of studying and every, like all of this, how to write a good blurb, how to write a good title, how to have your, mar your cover photo on point for the market expectation. And I think that's been the best for me. So I released my first billionaire book on um, the end of September, the end of August last year. And, um, um, I'm on point to be over a, a to be a six figure author at the end of October because you know we do the 60 day Amazon lag. Okay. So if you count from November 1st of last year to October 31st, obviously which hasn't happened yet, but I'm on point to be a six figure author, and it's all because I have worked hard to study the market in sweet romance and to hit that genre right so that 
a reader who comes to me knows I know exactly what I'm going to get. Well, congratulations. That's a fantastic uh, story. We're really pleased for you. And um, occasionally you find somebody who says, oh, I'm never going to write to market. It's so tawdry. And uh, they can go and listen to another podcast because this is all about people like you, Amy, right? right? Who, mm-hmm. who know their market, who know that they want to do this for a living. They want to be paid for their writing. And you did it. And you did it actually quite quickly. The writing process, and I sympathize with you about the four-year book you write that teaches you how to write. I'm in that at the moment and definitely learning that process. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the books, hopefully, touch uh, whatever this desk is made out of in the future, might not even be the genre I'm on now, same as you. But it's a process, maybe slightly painful process you go through at the beginning. But you obviously had that kind of... um, uh, ability to take on the, the information, the stuff you'd learnt about how to write a book and how not to write it, combined with your commercial acumen. So well done. Right. That's great. Oh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I love it. You can cut your husband down. You can do another hour in the shed, wherever he works, in the office, five yeah. hours. <laughs> so um, how many books have you done then in the since you turned to Sweet Romance? So I have, okay, let me think. I have a, a whole billionaire series. It's five of them. And then I switched to a uh, fake romance or fake marriage trope. And I currently have four of those. And then recently I decided to switch over to do some YA contemporary romance. And I have two of those and I'm releasing one next week and then a novella. So however many that is. Yeah, How many is that's that? knocking on 15 or something, isn't it? Did I count that yeah, right? and I have, a, and then I have a collection. Um, my billionaires put into a box set, so that one actually makes me pretty decent money on a regular basis. My box set. Wow. So, um, I think I have twelve, is what it is. Okay, okay. So prolific. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about process uh, in a moment, and, and and story ideas and so on. Um, I think you better describe to me. I mean, I have an idea. Sweet romance is. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum from kind of erotic romance so it's going to be cuddly not not um uh, sexually explicit uh, for want of a better right, expression yeah. um but there's other aspects to this trope that i won't be aware of when you mentioned fake marriage uh, i genuinely haven't heard of that mark's a bit more in tune with some of the genres than i am but i haven't heard of that before well so sweet romance is um if you ever get Kalytics, which is an awesome um, program to get, they break down clean and wholesome. It's actually a brand new, only two years old um, category in Amazon. And the, what happened was when the Fifty Shades of Grey stories came out, all these authors were like, oh, wow, okay, that's making money. I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. And so there became a vacuum in Amazon because sweet romance is basically kissing and that's it there is or and if anything happens the door shuts it's pg-13 or less um and so there became a vacuum and a lot of people started turning to amish and um mail order bride romances christian romances type things and amazon noticed this and so they started a clean and wholesome category now the only part that's hard about clean and wholesome category is there's only one category that's it there's no sub categories on there. So you could be clean and wholesome Regency, you could be clean and wholesome male order bride, clean and wholesome contemporary, but there's no other categories underneath it. We're hoping Amazon realizes that this has now become a hot genre and group of people are looking for it, that they'll break it down into more subcategories. But when Amazon realized that all the authors went over there or all to the to write underneath the Fifty Shades of Grey, if you watch Kalytics, it's like, here's here's Fifty Shades of Grey. Since then, it's been trending down. But Clean and Wholesome has actually started because they just started two years ago. As always, it's continuing to trend up. And I think it's because there you can hit a wider range of people who are willing to read Sweet Romance and will cross uh, we'll cross over to um, more erotica, but it's not really that other, or excuse me, that will read erotica, but we'll cross over to sweet romance, but not the other way around. Those people who okay. only want to read sweet romance won't go and read erotica. So um, 
that's kind of what sweet romance is. There is also clean. So clean is also no swearing or very little swearing, um, violence, no grotesque violence in, in your book. So it's pretty much what you would give your 13 year old daughter to read. That is what I write. So sweet romance could have some profanity and some allusions to violence, perhaps not obviously sort of graphic, oh. graphic descriptions, but it could have some, some of that in it. It's just the sex is not there. Right, right. And and it, you can have some. Um, it's just what you would like. It has to be closed doors yeah. or they're starting to kiss and then the the camera pans away. The you light know? goes off. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> in the old days, they used to show a train going into a tunnel, didn't they? As a, yeah. As the next yeah. scene. To and cut it's to. actually really hard to figure out. The biggest plight I have among a lot of people, and this was one of the reasons why I... Um, really had a hard time reading when I before I knew all of this about Amazon categories is nobody knows where to find romance books that don't have it there's all these times you're reading a book and and I believe there are readers for everybody so don't think I'm trying to bash spicy romance at all like if you have a market and people will read it then then write in it that's not something I write and that's something I'm comfortable writing or reading and I could never find books that I knew I could read from cover to cover and there wasn't going to be anything that I have to be like and I'm going to shut the book and put it away because that's not what I want to read okay so, that, so, so that's, I was going to ask about that this is not just um, a sort of very commercially orientated decision there's a bit of you in this decision as well this is a genre that you are personally comfortable with and you like the idea of these books being available for you exactly. to read as well as write mm -hmm. okay it's something i would read and that's always been my major thing is i want to write something i would read and i'm comfortable with reading and i and i think it's such an underserved market because a lot of people just don't know how to find you and i recently did a poll when i turned when I was like, okay, I'm gonna kind of shift genres a little or age groups and I'm gonna write YA instead of some adult. And I wanted to know from my newsletter, would you read YA? And I got like, basically I found out I have anywhere from 16 year old readers to over 90 year old readers. And it was mostly like the 70 and older that were like, well, I have a really hard time associating myself with them when that age. Um, but literally everybody else was like, of course, I love what you write. I will write any, I will read anything you write or I love YA. Um, I have no problem with that. So I think when I, that kind of taught me that I have a much bigger age range of people to um, please. And I just found out my sister told me my 11 year old niece just read one of my billionaire books and loved it. So I think, it, there's you just have a bigger market of people that you can reach once you reach them and it's hard to find them because I think a lot of times you go to Amazon they're gonna be like oh well that's gonna have steamy stuff in it and I can't read that how do I find sweet romance amongst all this other romance yeah I think there probably is a general expectation when you see a, a a romantic book cover that there's probably going to be some sex in there. I don't know if it's just a, right. if that's just me, but I would assume. So how do you signal? This is something we talked about off air that we were going to talk about in the interview, and it does interest me, and it's commercially very important. It's how you signal to your market through, I guess, the marketing aspects of the book, what it is. I think the biggest one is your cover and who you have on your cover. So spicy romances normally have the shirtless guy or they have the couple in compromising positions laying down on each other. Um, their facial expressions, too, if it's not so much just smiles, but kind of like, I don't know, I don't really Sim want to make simpering. a face on simpering. you. Too. Right, right. So it's hinting at what's going to be happening. And that's actually a great marketing tool for people who write spicy romance, because then the people who are out there looking for it know, I know what I'm going to get. A problem is, though, if you if you put something that's more compromising on your cover, but your sweet romance, you will find reviewers who get upset. They're like, well, it just didn't, wasn't like what I normally read, or I was really wanting the sex, or I want this, like people will review negatively if your book is not where it's supposed to be in terms of the cover. So all of my covers, they're the men, my billionaires especially, are all in suits and the girls are all dressed and then if they're together they're clothed unless it's a beach scene you could get away with having a beach scene that's sweet as well um but then it's not so that there's the cover aspect of it but there's also the title and subtitles that you can put in um because a lot of people will will uh search like clean romances or sweet romances and so if you make that in part of your my series title is just a clean billionaire romance and then 
then um, so that way people can find it and know, oh, the title is A Clean Billionaire Romance. And I think there's a banner on my cover that says A Clean Billionaire Romance. So they know, okay, this is what I'm going to get. So cover and title are huge. And then in your blurb as well, because I know Amazon pulls like words from your blurb. So at the end, a lot of people will say, this is a clean romance or this is a sweet romance. I don't really ever do that, but I also, I don't know. I just, I've never put it in my blurb. I think my cover and having it in my title is is enough for me. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, that's interesting because I'm just trying to work out when this is going to go out. I think probably at the point this is going out, the next week is our next book lab. Uh, with okay. Gretchen S.B., who's a paranormal romance writer, and she has done exactly what you've suggested. It says on the cover of her book, a paranormal romance uh, book, uh, part of her series. And then in the blurb, again, what you were talking about, Brian Cohen, who rewrote her blurb, put some language in there that didn't say there's sex in this book, but made it clear through the blurb, through a, you know, a good description of the narrative, that that's that stuff's in there because that's important. As you say, it's important to signal the contents of the book so as not to get those negative reviews from people who didn't get the good stuff or were shocked and had to close the book, as you say. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. Commercially important in, in, in every possible way. So the... Um, and I think... Go on. Okay. I was going to say, I think that spicy romances, they do showcase it. So as long as none of your blurb... Um, talks about it like I'm thinking back to like when I was searching YA books the ones that had sex in it talked about it and it in the blurb so a lot of YA is told first person the blurb is done through first person and so they bring it up which is kind of helpful for us who are writing sweet ones because it it if it doesn't if you don't say it then most of the time people assume you don't my goal has always been i want my cover to be on point i want my titles to be on point and i want to establish myself as an author that i don't have like somebody who's like oh yeah i've had, i've read an Anne marie meyer book i know she's clean i don't have to be told it's clean i already know so i my goal has always been be on point if you have to explain like things to a reader you're going to lose them so if you if you have everything else lined up i've never really had anybody complain on mine that it wasn't a spicy romance yeah so there's no so. Uh, there's no misleading uh, elements to your <laughs> to your cover and so on um, and in terms of the uh, the series you do do you do you drift or you you have already alluded to the fact that you drift between some of these subgenres in sweet romance and there's i'm getting the feeling quite a lot yeah, so one of our big things that we talk about um, on our Writing Gals podcast and just something we believe is showcasing tropes. And a lot of people are like, well, trope is a cliche. Like, why would I do a cliche? Well, no, a trope isn't a cliche. It's like if you were to think about the last movie you watched, right? Think about the one you watched. And I was to say, tell me about that movie. You would pick out the tropes from that movie to explain to me about it because then I can think back to all the ones that I've seen and go, oh, it was a best friends to lovers one? Yes, I love that. I'm gonna go buy that book or watch that movie or buy that book because I know that's something I enjoy and as a trope that I love. And so we find tropes to write in. So if you notice, I did a whole series just on billionaires because billionaires is a hot trope. It's a hot trope in spicy romances and it's a hot trope in sweet romances. And honestly, if you go to Clean and Wholesome, ever since we started our podcast, there's a lot more people writing billionaire romances that are sweet. It's just a huge trope because people know I love the story about a guy who has a ton of money. He can spend a ton of money. And most of the time, it has to be a guy. If you vary from that trope, people aren't too happy with you. And so it's always the rich guy with the poor girl sort of story. But if you write that, people know, oh, I like billionaire romances. I'll get that. Or... And so once I wrote, the, wrote those five, I was like, well, I don't want to be only known as a billionaire romance writer, so I'm going to switch and change up my trope. And every book inside of that series is now going to be based on a fake marriage or a fake engagement where they're on their way to getting married. And so it's kind of actually helpful because it tells me what to write. So I'm like, okay, I have five books, so I'm going to write one is marrying a cowboy, the other one's marrying an athlete. So I tried to start picking on marrying a billionaire and um, marrying a prince was the last one I put out. I'm working on marrying a spy right now. So you know there's two tropes because spies and um, billionaires a trope, cowboys a trope, and an athlete is a trope. So I try to showcase my trope in my title 
so that you know, okay, I love those two tropes and they sound exciting, so I'm gonna read them. I don't want any guesswork at all for my readers. I want it to be like, look at it, look at the cover, there's a girl in a wedding dress, I love that, I'm gonna read it. Just explain what fake marriage is. So it's really hard to write in modern day times because back in like mail order bride or regency, they got married. It's a marriage of convenience. So it benefits you, it benefits me, but there's no feelings there. So, so how, how's that a romance them, trope? Because they fall in love. Ah, gotcha. Because they're forced. Oh, okay. So fake marriages are amazing because the adhesion is awesome because they have to be together. Yes. Because they're going to fake that they're married. So right now my marrying a spy, she has a dad who's gotten into some trouble with the law. And so he, the spy's like, I need you to, we're going to fake a marriage so we can snuff out your dad to get him here. Okay. Sort of thing. So they have, they, and then it's through that fake marriage that they fall in love and you can have them maybe a bit spicy and narky with each other and eventually work out that they don't hate each other after all they okay i can see yeah, that I can my see favorite that trope is as enemies to lovers that's one yeah, of my favorite tropes yeah, okay because i just love it when you can get them going back and forth and it's yeah. like there's subtext in there talking and they're just arguing i just i don't know it's one well, it's of my hard, favorite is ones it, was it hard, not heart to heart what was the bruce willis um Oh, this is showing my age. It's long, probably long before your time. Anyway, I'll think of it. But there was a fantastic Bruce Willis um, comedy drama with uh, um, the actress who was in Cheers. Anyway, I'm rambling like an old man. But it was <laughs> no, but see, right there, you're an example it. of, yeah. yeah, a trope. I just told a trope to you yes. and you pulled back on yeah. what you remember and what you love. And so if I was to say, hey, if you love that, go check out Finding Love with the Billionaire because it's an enemies to lovers trope, you'd be more apt to because you know exactly what you're getting into. But on the other hand, it can be bad because if you pretend that the trope's there or if it's not a strong trope, people will get upset. So if you, t if you say they're faking a relationship, but then the relationship is faked, so this is what I did, and ended chapter two, then I get people, I had a reviewer who said, I really was hoping that the fake relationship would go through the whole story and it didn't. So you got to kind of be careful when you're playing and when you do a trope, do it all the way through. So it's quite restrictive in plot and writing terms. Do you ever feel a little bit suffocated like that? Do you ever want to, you know, you say you're, you're cautious about turning things on their head, but a lot of writers want to do that. Well, and I think... Anybody, any book, like even the book you're writing right now, maybe not necessarily a romance trope, but there is a trope in your book. And so what you could do is take your book that you've written and figure out, well, what tropes am I using? Because it's all the storyline, all of the stories you've been told your life have been like percolating in your brain. So when you go to write something, you're going to write something that you like. So there's still even in like a fantasy or sci-fi there are tropes that you're writing that are familiar. And what what I think people should do and what I've done is I extract those tropes. I keep the story as a whole, but I extract the trope so that when I showcase it, they know, okay, this is the, this is the trope that runs through the entire story. So they know right away what they're getting. Okay. Good. Well, that's a, that's a thoroughly uh, a good explanation for me of the uh, of the genre and subgenres and tropes and the writing to market, which you take very uh, was a central part of your commercial endeavor as a writer is to keep an eye on that market and make sure that you keep within it. And that's really good advice. And in fact, that is, you know, we we do we do speak to people who struggle. Uh, and they very often self-identify very early on, I can't really place my books into a, an easy genre. And that's a pretty tough moment for a writer who may have had this passion in this rather bizarre area of life all their life to realize they need to put that aside and write something to market. Right. And that's when studying, especially as indie authors, because you could write and title a book, whatever you want. And if you have the backing of traditional publishers behind you to push that marketing, like my goal has always been, I want to write, but I want to spend as little on ads as possible. I want something that can be picked up by Amazon and that Amazon is pushing yeah. for me. 
then that's my goal. Um, and so that's what mark, writing to market. And it sounds constraining, but it's really not. When I go down, sit down to write, I'll get an idea. Okay, I need to write this. And then I'll go to the tropes and I'll say, okay, well, I can put that trope in and that's great. And I can put that trope. You're really just building the conflict of your story. And then from there, you add, you breathe life into your characters and into their dialogue and then their situations and you make them super embarrassing or, you know, like you get to do all that fun stuff, but it takes a lot of that guesswork out of your story, which I love because sometimes I start writing and I'm like, there's not enough conflict. But if I start out with some tropes and then no, okay, well, this is the reason why they they don't want to fall in love or this is the reason she's a jilted bride. That's another trope. That's why she's not going to just glom on to the main male character. That That's super helpful for me. Yeah, that's great. And I can see that working straight away. I mean, I'm thinking about my own, own writing and uh, with the main genre of thriller. Within that, it is sometimes quite difficult. And I'm working with editors at the moment to, to find those moments of conflict. But had there been, had I thought of that trope, oh, this is like as you, you you've given a couple of examples of enemies to lovers etc there you go it's kind of mm-hmm. given to you that so you've got to have that conflict and there it is and and because you know what's pulling them apart as yeah. well as what can bring them together as well which like fake marriage you got your adhesion you really don't know you to do very much beyond that so it's green card isn't it the uh plot of green cards that <laughs> again my brain's working of the guy who wants the green card and the marriage of convenience and of yes. course inevitably so yes, yes. nothing exactly. there's nothing new exactly. under the sun every story is being told um yeah good well look, um i want to talk to you about writing process as well because you are prolific amy there's no question about that and in a 12 mm-hmm. month span you produced uh, all these series and books so uh, how do you go about your writing Um, Well, I didn't start out as fast as I am, but when you continue writing in the same genre, you learn the beats that are required. So you'll start writing and you're like, okay, and now this is the moment where something needs to pull them apart. And then you keep going and this is where I'm going to have my almost kiss. And then like for sweet romance authors, the epitome of everything is the kiss, which is nice because there's always that sexual tension that I think gets diminished when you have a spicy book. Because once that happens, then you're like, okay, well, where do you go from here? Um, So it didn't happen as fast as it does now um, because I just write similar stories and the same beats happen. That's pretty much the more you write, the easier it becomes and the faster you become. And do you plot these out? So I'll go ahead. So do you plot these out in advance or do you have this? Are you you a pantser? I'm a pantser, but I plot my tropes out in advance and that's the pretty much the best thing I can do. I do write down like this character has this color hair and this color eyes. So it just stays consistent. And sometimes I'll write down like big bullet points, but I'm a discovery writer. So I write and then I'll be like, well, then that whatever I just put down for my plot is just out the window now. I'm not going to do that anymore. So I sometimes find it I'm too constrained if I try to outline. I just sit down and just let the story kind of happen and I have a sense of when I'm like okay I'm getting bored writing this so I obviously I need to add something in it because if I'm bored writing it someone's gonna be bored reading it and how how long are your writing sessions so I sit down and I go for 5,000 words a day and that takes me about two and a half hours so I joined a lot of writing sprints. I'm a very competitive person. And so I joined writing sprints groups on Facebook because I like to write really faster than a lot of people there. So it keeps me motivated to keep going. I did have someone who told me this, that they write down like 500, like 10 times on a piece of paper. And every time they hit that 500 words, then they cross it out. It's very satisfying to do. Um, I think we get too much into our heads and it's easier if you just say, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to write. And a lot of times the whole, and there's been times where I've sat down, I'm like, this is crap. Nobody's going to read this. This is horrible. Why am I doing this? But then when I step away from it and I come back the next day, I'm like, oh, wow, I wrote that. That's actually not that bad. So I think it's just kind of pushing past your insecurities. And I think anybody has the capacity to write faster if they can just let their mind, you know, free their mind and say, it doesn't have to be perfect when I write it. Isn't it great what the internet's given us? I mean, all these writing sprints and competitive little moments, uh, you know, poor old Edgar Allan Poe and Arthur Conan Doyle had to write to each other. And say, should we do right. a, a writing sprint on May the 2nd? And then, and then also they would have to count the words. 
With a pen yes. on their bit of paper. Yes. Whereas now, you know, mm-hmm. you can do, let's do a thousand words, 5,000 words, whatever. And I've done a couple myself recently and they're great. Um, okay, so you write in Scrivener or Word or how do you do that? I write in Scrivener. I love being able to move things around. I probably don't utilize Scrivener, Scrivener as much as I do, but I kind of just like it the way I do. And I write chapter to chapter. I find it hard for me to like gum, go jump ahead and then come back and write. I pretty much write from beginning until end. And you know, I would say that the more money you make, the more motivated you become. It's amazing how you're like, I really want to get another book out because my book sales are slipping down. I got to get moving on this book. But like for me, my YA books just kind of spill out of me. I can write them in like a week because I just love the story so much. And, and they're many- very similar. You're like talking, we're writing high school kids in a high school. Your, your setting is very similar from book to book. Uh, how many words are your books? 50,000 words. Okay, so quite short for novels. Mm-hmm. So that is, yeah, that's yeah also, they're nothing like... That's also part of the genre. Yes, yes. And it's hard to... When I write, it's straight romance. That's the only really plot going on in the story. If I was to add a lot of other subplots, like my YA fantasy ones were 75,000 words because I had so much more going on. If if you if you're trying to stretch your romance it's almost to the point of annoyance i think to some readers because you're like well they should just get together already or i knew this or you're just being a repetitive in your stories so if you're just writing straight romance no other subplots fifty thousand words is pretty much i think your maximum anywhere i mean like fifty thousand to fifty seven thousand is kind of where i write kind of end where does it end but i think if you try to drag it on you would just, I know I would be annoyed. I mean, can you imagine you're watching a movie that's a romance and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, get on with this. I'm, I'm bored. I know they, he wants her, but can't have her. And she's depressed. And you know, like all those things you're like, I'm done. Just get together. You Kiss know, already. that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah, Especially yeah. in my books, that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have that kiss on the first page. Okay, so let's no. uh, let's talk about marketing then. So obviously you've cracked this side of it. So how did you, once you made this decision to indie publish, how did you learn the system? Well, I think if you hit your genre and your tropes and your cover and you my biggest marketing tool would be probably newsletter swaps which are huge especially when you're trying to establish yourself as a sweet romance author for us our also bots are super important so there'll be authors who will write sweet romance and they're like i don't know what's what's going on all of a sudden my also bots are like morphing into ones with shirtless guys what do i do guys i don't this is not where i want to be so i think newsletter swaps for me have been huge finding other indie authors to swap newsletters with have been really Really essential in in my um, wheelhouse, especially with launching books. Um, but to keep my books high in rank, to kind of keep that visibility, um, AMS ads and Facebook ads. I mean, I talk about those, and I, as scary as Facebook ads are, I think they're my favorite because you they get are. that immediate feedback with Amazon you're just like put it up and if it works it does and if it doesn't it doesn't you know and I'm tending my budget at $30 and they're spending pennies but Facebook is on the other hand will show your ad and it can be good and bad because all of a sudden you're like I think I spent $100 in a night one time and I woke up the next morning and this is when I really wasn't making money and I had to go to my husband I was like I spent $100 and I don't know what happened and it was like a blink of the eye and because I sent my cost per click or what I was willing to pay at like 60 cents and man then Amazon will then Amazon spends your money pretty fast yeah they'll spend your money really quick whether the advert's working good or bad they'll spend the money so you do yeah I I like called them up and I was like what happened and they're like well you said you're and I was like well you're right it's my fault so I can't get mad at you because I was not the smart person so well Mark always says start small start to scale up slowly uh, just to reiterate that to people um yeah uh, some of his first advice so you you did a lot of this research on your own you you you've um I know you have bought our course and you've you've presumably learnt off other people as well in the sector but you've done a lot of this donkey work yourself I would say if you're going to look for a course and this is me I was not paid to tell you Mark Dawson's course is amazing because he does all that guesswork for you I I started out and I was like I'm going to learn this myself so I did actually listen and watch a lot of Mark Dawson's 
YouTube videos that he so graciously just gives freely, um, joining um, Facebook groups as well, and um, learning from those people who are experts, reading books. And then a lot of it was just um, figuring out myself. The hard part about Sweet Romance and Facebook ads is there are not a lot of traditionally published Sweet Romance authors. And so it's hard to find your audience on Facebook because those aren't people you can target. So if you're a starting out author and you don't have a huge newsletter that you can use as a lookalike, it's really difficult to find an audience that is receptive to your books. So I tried to go more the actions, what people like. So but I think Sweet Romance has like 6,000 likes on Facebook. So it's not even a big category to really market to. But I, I thought about like, you know, a lot of religious people, um, like certain types of books so i marketed to them um and also just like if you like love stories or if you like you know i don't know i just kind of picked a bunch of just actions that they would enjoy and that seems to be a sweet spot i do pretty well with my cost per click with them um but we would love to see more sweet romance you know traditionally published authors so we can market to yeah. them but it's i mean you say there's not huge presence on facebook and difficult to find the successful authors and yet it's a billion dollar indie industry. No question about yeah. it. I mean, Sweet Romance turns over. Num- we've, you know, we've spoken to many, many five figure a month Sweet Romance, clean romance authors in this sector. Yeah. So how crazy was it all these years that the traditional industry, what were they just snobbish about it thing? Didn't want to publish them? I mean, they missed out on, uh, you know, these, this audience hasn't been created by the indie market. It's just being served by them. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about how big Hallmark is, and that, you know, if you think I want a clean, sweet romance story, it's Hallmark that you're talking about. And actually, Hallmark has now moved into the ebook category where it used to be just movies. Now you can actually write ebooks for Hallmark and you can submit to them to have them published. But I think, you know, if you think of Harlequin, they're a huge, huge romance like giant. And they kind of set the stage for what's going to be published. And it is sad because you're like, there are authors who or readers who want who don't want to read spicy romance. And why aren't you serving them? So I'm hoping that with the traditionally published people seeing how well indies are doing, they're going to start picking up on that. Because I believe all, you know, a rising tide rises all ships. So if it's a traditional published is getting into this and not writing all those other things that we will actually be boosted up as well. Would you take a tra- trad deal now? I, uh, yeah. No, it depends. I would want, I actually just want my books put into movies, but who doesn't? <laughs> I'm kind of hoping Netflix has been really big on putting out some YA romances right now. So I'm hoping that they see me I actually have a friend who's been reached out to by a publishing company or a producing company. And so, you know, that that's only like the gate. And then there's all these paths that you have to cross and get, you know, hurdles you have to get over. But like that's, for example, I think one of the reasons why my YA books have been doing so well, because Netflix is feeding people with these YA romances. And what do they do? I want to go read more YA romance books. So really, it you kind of see like, well, if I help out that person, then that's taking money away from me when in actuality, it's not that way at all. Me and my husband go to a movie every week. That's what we do for our date night. I've got five kids. I need a break and I don't want to go out and walk or talk or work. Like I just want to sit and not be touched or bothered. And so to think like this is the last movie I'm ever going to watch, that's not true, which is why movies are continually put out every week because people go see it. We want to be entertained. We want a moment away from our life. So if there's if we're supporting people and getting more people converted over to being a reader, then it's only going to help us in the long run. Yeah. So I think that if I could get a, a movie producer like a production company, then I would probably find an agent. And then I would like to see what they could do. But I've watched Hugh Howie and he's like, I don't know, I turned down seven figure author deal because I'm like, no, wait a minute. It's not your name that's being put on my book. It's my name that's being put on your book. And I'm starting to feel that way. But it's hard because you're like, you tell people, oh, I'm a self-published author. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. You can, you know, make it as a tradition. I'm like, well, no, no, no. I made 20 some thousand dollars last month. You don't understand. Like traditionally published people don't make this much in an advance. So this is actually better. But it's hard because that, that stigma is on you as an indie author. It's changing. 
That is changing, yeah. that question, although uh, uh, perhaps not as fast as we'd like. Well, I'm sure there's a Hollywood mogul or two listening to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> and Marie Keep my fingers crossed. Yeah. So you'll <laughs> Check get, out my books, they're yeah, great. <laughs> exactly. Netflix, listen up. Um, yeah, we've, we know a few people who've uh, been contacted, particularly uh, production companies targeting Netflix, who are certainly spending uh, on productions at the moment. And I hope that continues. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, we, uh, we've rattled through the time. We're sort of up to 40 minutes. And uh, I want to say thank you, Amy. Uh, I think we've covered all the main areas we said we were going to talk about. So we talked about how to make sure that your cover and blurb, etc., clearly signal what's in there, how to write to market, how to uh, do your marketing. We sort of touched on that a little bit. But um, I think it's been uh, absorbing listening to somebody who's, who's got a lot of this right and is enjoying reaping the benefits of it. Yeah, and definitely. And I, I, if I could put a little plug for our podcast, which is called The Writing Gals, we're not as big as you. But if you want to learn more about sweet romance from authors willing to give you information, join us on Facebook or YouTube. And we're not as fancy. We're very like low tech Google Hangouts on YouTube. But we love to talk about romance and what we're doing and really wanting to get the word of sweet romance out there so people can not only start writing in it, but knowing that there are authors that are willing to give you what you want to read. So Sounds great, Amy. Where do people go? The Writing Gals? So we have a YouTube channel just called The Writing Gals. And then we have a Facebook page or Facebook group that's growing every day called The Writing Gals as well. So it's just four of us um, sweet romance authors that are there that just kind of goof off and talk. We Our tagline is stay us for sweet romance authors staying up late because our podcast goes every Thursday night at 10 o'clock central time. So we're pretty get pretty loopy towards the end and kind of goofy because it's like eleven o'clock and so we're all Thursday tired. Thursday night's obviously not date nights. Thursday night is podcast night. No. Cinema night's yeah. another night. I'm getting to I'm getting to a <laughs> calendar. Um, good. Look, Moonlighting, by the way, was the name of the TV series from a thousand uh, years ago that I remember that had um, Bruce Willis and I think Kathleen Turner. And it okay. was, and people watched it every week because of the sexual tension between the two. Apparently, they didn't get on, but it was unbelievably simmering in this kind of detective, oh, uh, private gosh. detective agency. There's but the new movie that Netflix just put out, the Ginzy Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society movie, oh, no yeah. touching, like none at all. And when they do touch, you're like, oh my gosh! Like, so it's amazing that you can still create that tension yeah. without having it go. Well, Moonlighting, way, as I remember, so. was on at tea time. It was uh, it was an early evening <laughs> thing. So, yeah, it was definitely uh, in the PG uh, area. So, brilliant. Amy, uh-huh. thank you so much indeed. I'm going to let you go. You've got, well, it's middle of the afternoon, I guess, in Minnesota. But at some point, there's going to be five children in your house. And I guess you need to do some work before then. <laughs> I do. Okay, there you go. So, uh, we were having a quick chat about this off air, about how big this genre is. And... Uh, One thing I think is clear is that although we can both name some fairly big, well-known publishers of clean and wholesome sweet romance books, and you quoted Mills and Boone, famous uh, British uh, house, and I think it's Harlequin or we're arguing about Harlequin or Hallmark in the States who do something similar. But traditional publishing, a lot of the big houses have been a little bit snobby about this. And it's been definitely been an area that's breathed, had life breathed into it thanks to the indie revolution. And uh, a lot of people are making good money in this sector. Yeah, it's been a pretty big, it's a big, it's, it's a very, very big niche. I mean, it's, I don't think um, it's ever really gone away. I mean, my, this kind of stuff that my mum reads. Um, so there's there's a lot of readers out there. They, they tend to be fairly avid readers. You get through them reasonably quickly. Um, so yeah, it's a big lucrative area, um, and and indies have have moved into it in in the same way that they've moved into ev- every single area. Um, so, you know, lots of potential. Now, this area of um, Amy and I were talking about of, of of making clear in your blurb and your marketing what it is you're getting in your book to make sure that you don't end up as she did uh, on on a, or you know, people get bad reviews because they're expecting it to be clean and there's a sex scene in it or vice versa and they thought this is a romance going to be a racy romance and it turns out to be very clean they're equally disappointed and and if you don't manage that expectation with your marketing you can end up falling foul of these reviews. How does that work in your genre then, Mark, to broaden this out a little bit? Because do you think, because you and I know a lot about the tone and impact of violence, because we used to work as film examiners in the UK, and we know straight away that if you put a certain le- level of visceral violence in a film, it changes its tone, and that can confound expectations if you put it into a James Bond film, like Casino Royale is a good example of when that happened. 
Do you write like that? Do you not write a visceral violence scene because you want it to be a kind of James Bond s thing, or do you deliver? Do you make conscious decisions about the l- level of violence you deliver? I don't do gore very much, um, and that's not that's not really because I couldn't write that way, but I just don't enjoy writing that way. So I'm not ever going to write. And Chris Carter is a pretty good example of there's lots of writers like that who um, just pile on the gore, make it very um, you know, gruesome, which is not really. I wouldn't read that. I don't think, and I and I probably wouldn't want to write it. But for the uh, the Milton books, um, they're, they're fairly, they're quite, they are quite like the Casino Royale level. Bond. So they're, they're fairly visceral. Milton, especially the Beatrix Rose books, tend to be a bit more action-packed and a bit more kind of Jason Bourne. But Milton tends to be more realistic. It's more character-based. Um, if he gets shot, it's not something that he, he kind of shrugs off in the next scene. It's going to be with him for the rest of the book. And then one of the books, uh, Sword of God, he, he shot about midway through the book. No, no spoilers there. But by the end of it, he is basically almost out on his feet. So it's... um. Yeah, I, I try and make it realistic. I've I've never had um, readers come to me and um, complain about the violence. We- weirdly, occasionally, I'll get people complaining that there's, there's cursing. Okay. Um, but they've got no problem with the violence. And that's something that we've seen. Um, we saw that a lot when we were looking at films in that you know, people would complain about, or, or we would have to be conscious of sex, but not so much of violence because people tended to be more upset by sex and, and more inured to violence, which if you think about it, is the is asked about face. Yes. Um, you really ought to be more concerned about <laughs> good, you know, violence. Good expression. But yes, it's always been weird, but that's very well known, particularly in Western countries that, yeah, you can have a far higher level of violence than you can sex in a film before it, it goes up the categories or uh, engenders complaints in people. It was weird. It was always, if you look at the uh, films that we saw in America, the MPAA would, um, again, completely off topic here, but they, they would um, be much more conservative about sex, less concerned about violence. We were the complete opposite. We'd be much less concerned about sex, but more concerned about violence, which is probably, you know, from my perspective, we, we would have that the right way around. Um, Others, others may disagree with me on that one, but that, that's that's something that we saw. Um, and you see it, you know, so you see it in all media. So yeah. it is certainly something that you see in in books. Less, as I say, with, with regards to violence, I've never had a complaint about my books being too violent. Um, but I have had people complaining about the uh, the uses of f bombs, especially when people email me. I really enjoy replying to those emails because I will, rather than f dash dash dash, I am going to spell it out. Maybe even embolden it and put it in caps. Because frankly, um, they can. Do you put the F word in as, as many times as possible, explaining why tr- it was in the book? I try to, yeah, yeah. but in a, in a very polite way. I, I quite like the conflation of English politeness and yeah. and literally spelling out the uh, the offending article. Foul and That's abusive language. Bad. It's mischievous, I suppose, but um, it gives me a small amount of pleasure. So I'll keep doing it. Yes, I like that. Um, good. Well, I want to say congratulations to Amy because she's from a standing start as as really understood and got into this genre. And you can tell from the way she was explaining these sort of plot points to me, um, the way the books flow, that she thoroughly understands her audience and delivers time and time again, almost in her sleep now, the way she can write these books. And that is a very good commercial operation and she's unashamedly uh, open about that she wasn't in the interview that she chose this genre because it was going to make money and you know she's got five kids at home she needs it to as well and she's been successful at it and that's been uh, I love these celebratory type interviews with people who've, who've nailed this and um, well I shouldn't say nailed this because that obviously would go out of clean and wholesome but um, she's got it right uh, should we say yeah, would you would you consider that her story had an HEA I don't know what that means Listeners, he's he's looking confused. Well, there's lots and lots. I didn't know this until recently. There are tons of acronyms in in romance, and an H E A is a happy ever after. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So she, yes. her, her books will be yes, required but, by by genre trips yes. to have a happy ever after. Yeah, and the kiss, and the kiss was very important. The build up to it and the kiss, and you can't put the kiss on on page ten as she was saying. It's got to be <laughs> towards the end of the book. That's what it's all <laughs> about: getting to that kiss. Right. Uh, so thank you, Amy, for coming on to the uh, podcast. It was great uh, to have her on. And uh, I hope it was useful, not just for people who write in that genre, but thinking about A, writing to market and B, when you're in a genre, making sure that you signal that genre clearly to your potential audience to A, find your audience, get visibility, sell books, but also make sure that you don't end up um, confounding expectations of readers. That was like my little Jerry's final word, wasn't it? A little summing up. 
felt quite pleased with that. Jerry Springer, yeah, that's right. Dates me, doesn't it, that one? Good. Thank you very much indeed for uh, for listening, for watching this week. Uh, that's it. We're going to come back next week. We'll probably have a shout out to our new Patreon guests next week. Uh, and we are working towards the end of the year. It's a busy time for us coming up in November. Probably going to open up ads for authors, we think, in November. Is that right? Yes, I think November. Yep. And um, I'm going to be heading off to 20 Books in Vegas to talk about live video and how it works best for authors. So we might see you there, but we will always be here on a Friday you can count on it like the kiss at the end of an Amy Meyer book it's always going to be there thank you for watching thank you for listening we'll speak to you next Friday bye bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics you can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.